Hello, 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 and welcome everyone. Bienvenue, bienvenida. Welcome to this exciting occasion. I am your host, Alicia Ali. This is the opening ceremony for the regional workshop and validation of the OECS Blue Bio Trade Action Plan for the Queen Conk value chain in the Eastern Caribbean. We are live on the Facebook page of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and also on our YouTube channel. This live broadcast is brought to you by the Agency for Public Information in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So tell a friend to tell a friend to log on now. Today is a momentous occasion for us here in the Eastern Caribbean. We are continuing to advance the lives and livelihoods of the people of the OECS region by moving the Queen Conk industry forward. The Queen Conk is sometimes called, you know, scientifically, the Strombus Gigas or Lambi in Grenada. Or in St. Lucia, we call it Lubby. It is a highly appreciated seafood delicacy with important uses, including therapeutical products and handicrafts. But before I jump more into why we are here today, I need to acknowledge a few people. It is only fitting that we are in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We must acknowledge the Minister for Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, Rural Transformation, Industry and Labour, Honorable Saboto Caesar. Thank you for having us. And because we have been advancing the digital transformation agenda in the OECS, we do have some of our participants joining us virtually. We have Ms. Kim Frederick, who is the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry for Sports, Culture and Arts, Cooperatives and Fisheries from Grenada, who is joining us via Zoom. Welcome. And from St. Lucia, we have Barrymore Felicia, who is the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Physical Planning, Natural Resources, and Cooperatives. Welcome. And physically with us today, we have Dr. Didicus Jules, the Director General of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Jules. And we do have our regional partners, Luis Meyer, who is the head of cooperation for the European Union delegation to Barbados and the OECS and CARICOM and CARIC Forum, who is joining us via Zoom. Thank you very much for making it. And we have Mr. David Vivas, who is the legal officer for the UNCTAD. So thank you as well. And another partner that we have here with us today that we are very appreciative she was able to make it, Ms. Karen Gaynor, the Scientific Officer for CITES, who has been a close partner on this Blue Biotrade project. And I am so pleased at this time to welcome the Chief Fisheries Officers from Grenada, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as well as Dr. Megan Davis, who is a research professor in aquaculture and stock enhancement at the Florida Atlantic University. We'll hear from her a little bit later. And we have our partners in the Queen Kong value chain. Thank you to the fishers, the vendors, the chefs, the processors who have joined us for this workshop, who has been part of the consultative process from the very beginning of this project. Um, we have our development partners who we cannot, we cannot move forward without. We have the staff of the OECS, UNCTAD, CITES, and the European Union, our invited guests, our media colleagues who are here with us physically and also joining us on our virtual platforms, our social media and our Zoom, viewers from the OECS and across the world, I just want to thank you for joining us here today. For those of us on Zoom, let us know in the chat who you're representing. For those on Facebook and on YouTube, drop your flags in the comments. Tell us how you want to see our fisheries industry move forward. We love hearing from you. It is only fitting today that we begin our proceedings by inviting Honorable Saboto Caesar to deliver our welcome remarks. Minister, welcome. Thank you very much, my sister, Dr. Didicus Jules, the Director General of the OECS, all of the representatives from the different member states 
of the OECS, representatives from the, the EU, UNCTAD, CITES, SUSGREN, all persons joining us virtually, the conservationists in the room, stakeholders, the media, it's definitely a pleasure and an honor to welcome you to St. Vincent and the Grenadines and uh, to welcome your participation at this very important meeting that will continue over the next few days. A meeting with CITES is a meeting with the police. And uh, I want for CITES to be reassured that in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and in the OECS, that we are doing the best that we can to ensure that we follow international legal jurisprudence because we understand and appreciate our international legal obligations. In order to develop a modern fishing industry, it begins, first of all, with a clear expression of the political will. And in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in the OECS, and particularly at the OECS Secretariat level, there is that clear expression of the political will to do and to do what is right. Not only can you sit in the cabinet and express the political will, but it has to be framed into laws. Because at the end of the day, we are not operating in isolation of the rest of the world. We are global partners with the rest of the world. And uh, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, over the last five years, we have done significant work to promote the sustainability of the blue economy. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have a total ban on the capturing of turtles. We have a total ban on the capturing of the parrotfish. The issue of the finning of sharks, we have gone internationally and we have spoken against this. And uh, quite recently, we have concluded a survey of the marine space in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and it's part of a broader project to ensure that we have both a quantitative and a qualitative assessment of the conch and the lobsters that we have in our waters. The political will is number one. The legal framework is number two. And what we have witnessed as number three, what we have witnessed, is that once you have the laws right and you have the political will, the investors will come. And I want to recognize here this morning the local investors who we have in the fishery sector. And I want to commend them for their excellent work in ensuring that the principles and precepts of sustainability that they are maintained. And uh, the last issue that I want to touch on has to do with the implementation. And for the implementation, we must continue the excellent work and relationship that we have. Again, I want to thank the OECS Secretariat for the work that it continues to do. Welcome to St. Vincent and the Grenadines and please find some time outside of the busy schedule to enjoy more of our hospitality. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. 
And there is a clear expression of political will in the Eastern Caribbean to advance this industry. And Minister has given an overview of the steps that have been taken in St. Vincent and the Grenadines over the last five years to promote the sustainability of the blue economy. And he was very clear when he spoke about the trifecta of what is needed. So it's not just the political will, it's the legal framework and also the implementation. At this point, I would like to welcome Barrymore Felicia from St. Lucia's Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Physical Planning, Natural Resources, and Cooperatives to deliver remarks. Welcome, Mr. Felicia. Good morning. Thank you, Ms. Ali. Permit me to recognize the Honorable Saboto Caesar, Minister of Responsibility for Fisheries in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Didikas Jews, Director General of the OECS, representatives of UNCTAD, CITES, European Union, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I bid you a warm and pleasant good morning. Regrettably, the Honorable Alfred Prosper could not be with you today. He is unwell and he has asked me to deliver the following remarks on his behalf. The St. Lucia Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Food Security and Rural Development is pleased to have been a participant and stakeholder in this very important project. This workshop is the end of the first phase of an initiative entitled Seizing the Trade and Business Potential of Blue Biotrade Products for Promoting Sustainable Livelihoods and Conservation of Marine Diversity in Selected OECS Country, Blue Biotrade Project, which began in October 2020. More specifically, today's workshop will seek the validation of the OECS Blue Biotrade Action Plan for Queen Kong in the Eastern Caribbean country. This timely workshop, which is being funded by the European Union under the 11th EDF and is hosted jointly by the OECS Commission, UNCTAD, CITES, and the Government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, is very critical to ensuring the viable sustainability of the conch industry. This resource is of immense importance to St. Lucia's economy, and in this regard, St. Lucia is committed to supporting the continued development of the industry. We are acutely aware of the challenges that the industry faces, notably the depth to which the divers must go to sometimes exceeding 100 feet, and thus the associated medical and insurance requirements of the industry is critical. We are also cognizant of the need to enable fairer trade and marketing for the export of conch meat to nearby French territories so as to enable our fisher folk to get a more equitable return from the conch industry. Therefore, over the next two days, colleagues as well as participants will consider the key findings from the study and propose key actions and initiatives to mitigate the challenges and capitalize on the opportunities. It is our hope that these will result in better conditions for persons in the value chain. As we seek to move forward with the second phase of this project, we would need to consider the following actions, which will benefit not only St. Lucia, but the region. One, stock assessment of punk resource to determine the level or need for imposition of sustainable management practices to ensure the continued viability of the industry. And two, working towards the regularization and trade with the European Union territories and thus to seek to meet the standards required for trade. In closing, I wish to thank the European Union for their generous contribution to this initiative through the regional integration through growth harmonization and technology, right program. Also, I must thank the team from the OECS, CITES, and UNCTAD for their dedication, support, and significant work done during this year. The work will definitely help improve the conditions of those involved in the Congo industry, in particular the fisher folk. With these, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention and listening. God bless. And PS did speak about the challenges 
But what I really want to focus on is the collaborative approach that we are taking to move the industry forward. We have spoken about our partners and you'll hear more about them a little bit later. And so at this juncture, I'm going to invite Ms. Kim Frederick, the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Sports, Culture and Arts, Cooperatives and Fisheries of Grenada to deliver some remarks. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Honorable Saboto Caesar, Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, Rural Transformation, Industry and Labor of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. His Excellency Dr. Didicus Jules, Director General, Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and other staff of the OECS. Mr. Barimo Felician, Permanent Secretary, Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries, Physical Planning, Natural Resources and Cooperatives, St. Lucia. Mr. Louis Mai, Head of Corporation, EU Delegation to Barbados, the OECS and CARICOM. Staff of UNCTAD and CITES, other partners, participants, good morning. It is my pleasure for me to provide brief remarks on behalf of the Minister for Sports, Culture and the Arts, Fisheries and Cooperatives, Grenada, in this regional workshop and validation of the OECS Blue Biotrade Action Plan for the Queen Kong Value Chain in the Eastern Caribbean, hosted jointly by the OECS Commission, the United States Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, CITES, and the Government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. As you may be aware, Grenada is very active in the blue economy space from coastal sustainable development to fisheries and beyond. In Grenada, we recognize the importance of our marine resources and their potential to drive economic development and investment. In that regard, we welcome the work done by the OECS, UNCTAD, and CITES over the last year on the very important Queen Kong Value Chain project. The project with the assistance of CITES has identified pathways to resolving the trade-related issues and help with sustaining the Queen Kong industry. With our current timeline, it is our hope to have in place the relevant policies and legislation necessary for full CITES compliance by April 2023. Importantly, through the actions of this project in the past month, a legislative agenda was submitted to CITES detailing the steps we will take to enhance our compliance with CITES requirements. Grenada is a high capacity country in the fisheries sector. We have two HACCP certified facilities for the export of fisheries products, a European Union recognized competent authority and value added producers making tenderized conch meat, conch bur burgers and a lot more. For Grenada, a key next step is conducting a stock assessment to understand where the Queen Kong stocks are, what their status is, and when they come together to procreate. These crucial pieces of information are necessary for management measures, which we must consider, such as no-take zones and closed seasons. We are happy that those discussions have already begun with the project team, to seek funds to conduct such a stock assessment. The next phase of this project is of utmost importance to Grenada and the Ministry as we see many avenues to participate in the sustainable Queen Kong value chains within the OECS in order to improve the position of current and future fishers, value-added producers, processors, and exporters. Moreover, this initiative is timely as we have seen declining investment in the Queen Kong fishery and an exit of the divers from this industry. This means we could lose these necessary and highly skilled individuals who need to pass their abilities and skills onto the next generation. In the face of these challenges and numerous opportunities, we have a pathway ahead of us that will require hard work, but will yield worthwhile fruits Therefore, we must thank the European Union for their generous contribution to this initiative.
through the regional integration integration through growth harmonization and technology the right program we must also thank the team from the OECS, CITES, and UNCTAD for the significant work towards improving the conditions of those involved in the Grenadian and original Queen Kong industry. I thank you. And I must say I am quite heartened to hear that she has relayed the next steps for the industry in Grenada, as well as commitment to the stakeholders, um, especially the fishers in Grenada. And we are happy to support as the OECS and also as our development partners. You know, um, as we talk about development partners, we have heard quite a bit about the European Union. And I must say the European Union is a dedicated partner to the Eastern Caribbean. This first phase of the Blue Biotrade project is funded by the EU's 11th Economic Development Fund through the OECS EU Regional Integration through Growth, Harmonization and Technology Program. Or as we like to call it, the right program, because it is the right program for the Eastern Caribbean. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce you to Luis Maya, Head of Cooperation for the European Union Delegation to Barbados, the OECS and CARICOM and CARIFORUM. I think we're having some technical difficulties on that end. So, to keep moving right along, I am going to now talk about our collaborative approach. Uh, one of the things for us at the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Commission is that we are very big on collaboration. We believe that everyone needs to be involved. And so at this point in time, there is a man who is very very critical to the advancement of this industry, who has always encouraged us, the staff of the OECS Commission, as well as our diplomatic and technical partners to collaborate so that we can move our regional integration agenda forward. I would like to welcome uh, to deliver some remarks, Dr. Didicus Jules, who is the Director General of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Dr. Jules, welcome. Thank you very much, Alicia. <clears throat> the Honorable Saboto Caesar, Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, etc., St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Ms. Kim Frederick, PS in the Ministry of, among other things, Fisheries, Grenada, Mr. Barrymore Felicien, Permanent Secretary, St. Lucia, Mr. Luis Maia, Head of Cooperation of the EU Delegation, Mr. David Vivas, Legal Officer, UNTAD, Ms. Karen Gaynor, Scientific Officer, CITES, Chief Fisheries Officers from Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Megan Davis, Research Professor, Aquaculture and Stock Enhancement, our partners in the Queen Conk value chain, most importantly to this initiative, fishers, vendors, chefs and processors, development partners, our Director of Economic Affairs and Regional Integration, Ms. Jacqueline Emmanuel Flood, Colleagues of the OECS Commission, UNCTAD, CITES, and the EU, invited guests, media, viewers from the OECS and around the world. Our purpose this week is simple and exciting. It is to tangibly advance our ambition to protect the natural resource of our seascape while creating a sustainable blue economy. Our maritime space is 80, almost 85 times larger than our collective landmass. This statistic alone is an indicator of the potential of our blue economy, which in the context of all of the climatic perils that we face, necessitates a sustainable approach to its utilization. The regional workshop and validation of the, Queen, of the OECS Blue Biotrade Action Plan for the Queen Kong value chain is hosted jointly, as you've heard, by the OECS UNCTAD, CITES, EU, and the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I think Minister Caesar, in his remarks, spoke jokingly but seriously about the importance of CITES in this effort because we do intend to rigorously adhere.
to the international protocols and conventions and set an example of sustainable utilization of the resource. The workshop is a culmination of a project journey that started in October 2020. One stakeholder mapping, three country case studies, and countless hours of building relationships within and among the various actors and stakeholders of the Queen Kong value chain, or as some may call it, the Lambie industry. And again, that's an important thing that I need to punctuate because it's not a matter of us sitting in Geneva with CITES and with UNCTAD and developing a project plan, but importantly, working with our consultants like Alexander to meet with the fishers, visit the sites, talk to people, hear from them their views of the future of the industry, and on that basis, co-develop this initiative. The, as we have come to the end of this first phase of the Blue Biotrade Project in the Eastern Caribbean, I must also recognize the European Union for its integral role in supporting and advancing the Queen Conch industry in the OECS. As you've heard, it's funded by the 11th EDF Fund through the Wright Project. And um, over the next two days, you will hear from the chief fisheries officers of the three project countries, Grenada, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And let me emphasize that these are the initial project countries. We do not intend to leave any member state out. Um, experts, you will hear from the experts on trade and value chains from UNCTAD, legal and compliance experts from CITES, and importantly from yourselves, what we believe are the challenges, the opportunities, and the pathways to change that can help improve the conditions of our ecosystems, economies, but ultimately the people of the OECS. The trade in conch in the Caribbean has been estimated at a current but increasing annual value of 60 million US dollars. CITES data indicates that for the period 1992 to 2001, 21.6 million kilograms of conch meat was exported. 78% of international exports were to the United States, followed significantly by France, 19%, which includes Martinique and Guadeloupe, who are associate members of the OECS. The presence of Martinique and Guadeloupe are critical to this enterprise because the reality is that there is already an active below-the-radar trade between these French territories and the Anglophone fishers. This represents a special opportunity to shape a future of shared prosperity in full compliance with CITES protocols and set an example of sustainable use of our marine resources. While this multifaceted importance is partially captured by the millions of dollars in landings of Queen Conk across the project countries, and which therefore helps to sustain the rural economies. The biological reality is that this species is slow moving and thus comparatively easy to capture. Of course, over exploitation has taken its toll, which you heard earlier, resulting in fishers having to go to deeper and deeper depths. So the issue of this, the, uh, the, the challenges that this project seeks to address is not just the sustainable use of, of the resource, but also protecting the health of our fishers. Right? They cannot go into increasingly deeper depths to, to source that, um, that product. The Queen Kong takes between three to four years to reach maturity, and stakeholders now report that the state of stocks require them to seek more remote fishing grounds and deeper dives. So we're bringing it back to near shore in a sustainable way. With this initiative, we are assuming the responsibility of securing the sustainable and regenerative future of this most important resource. Over the next two days, we will discuss tangible steps through the Biotrade Plan of Action to improve the gaps and act on opportunities identified in the value chain in tangible ways based on social, environmental, and economic criteria. These proposed actions include cons considering stock assessments on closed seasons, improving data collection, enhancing CITES compliance, exploring restorative aquaculture through conch nurseries, and we've already identified that Union Island will be the site of the first of these conch nurseries, serving the region with hatchlings. Um, maximizing the use of bioproducts such as trimmings, pearls, and much more. It is important to also indicate that this is only the beginning 
as we intend to deal with other high value products such as sea urchin, spiny lobster, sea snail, what we call wigo. In closing, the most important takeaway call from this gathering over the next two days is a call to action that must be deliberate, urgent, pragmatic, and focus upon the key stakeholders, such as the conch fisher persons. And let me just also add in discussions with our political directorate, I think we are of the same view that the development of this industry, while open to investors, must be primarily owned and engage the fishers, the traditional fishers, the coastal communities who have for years been pursuing this, um, this trade. We have much work to do, and this needs to be executed on parallel tracks. All components must be simultaneously advanced. Since you would have heard from the life cycle of the conch, it takes three to four years before we can optimize the value and the returns from this initiative. Lastly, I want to situate this in the context of the OECS Commission's work plan. Our strategic work plan for the, this triennium includes a strategic objective of reinventing our economy in the context of the devastation to our economies caused by the pandemic and all climate change and all the other crises that we have been assaulted by. So this is a vital step in the reinventing of that economy. We are actually stepping into not unknown territory because for years fisher folk have done their thing, but moving it to a new level of sophistication, a new level of value, and a new level of prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jules. And you see what I said to you? He spoke about action, deliberate, urgent, and pragmatic action for the people of the OECS. And so it is really for us to thrive. And so at this point in time, um, we are going to be expecting the EU representative. Um, but while we sort out some technical difficulties, I am going to invite uh, Mr. David Vivas, who is the legal officer for UNCTAD, who has been an integral... Hold on one second. I think we are saying, do we have the EU rep with us? Uh, again, this is the wonderful things about technology. Yes, and we do have the EU representative. That is wonderful. So it is my pleasure at this point in time to welcome Luis Maya, Head of Cooperation for the European Union Delegation to Barbados, the OECS and CARICOM and CARIFORUM, who has been an integral supporter and advocate for the Eastern Caribbean. Welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. And I'm sorry for this technical problem. I think those are the challenges of uh, virtual communication. Good morning to you all and greetings from Barbados. Honorable Saboto Caesar, Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, Rural Transformation of San Vicente and Grenadines. Dr. Didakos Jules, Director General of the OECS, Permanent Secretaries representing Member States, Mr. David Vivas Yugi from UNCTAD, Ms. Karen Gaynor from SITS, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a pleasure to join you today in this hybrid format to share a few remarks on this initiative. And let me tell you that I'm really sorry that I cannot be there with you in person in the beautiful island of St. Vincent. Today's event represents an important milestone in the EU-funded OECS Blue Biotrade Project under, as it was said, the OECS EU Regional Integration through Growth, Harmonization and Technology, the right program. And this is a 10.3 million of euros program, as I said, funded by the EU. And this workshop also recognizes the importance of the Queen Kong fishery in the OECS sub-region and its role in job creation in areas such as processing, marketing, hospitality, food security and the creative sectors. Globally, the export potential of King Kong is high and is estimated at 70 million in 2017 and ranking second only to spin lobster 
in terms of export value of Caribbean fisher products. Overfishing, stock reduction, and other negative ecosystem impacts, however, present a continual risk to realizing the full potential of the fishery in the future. This balancing act between economic viability and environmental sustainability is central to understanding the role the blue economy plays in the development, particularly of small island developing states, including the member states of the OBCS. A sustainable blue economy creates opportunities for new jobs and businesses, contributes to carbon neutrality and can help alleviate pressure on our natural resources for food production. The blue economy plays a significant role in our Green Deal in Europe, as well as in our global partnerships in support of climate resilience. We recognize that promoting a sustainable blue economy for the European Union cannot stop at our borders, but must extend to supporting sound environment practices that support marine, uh, marine biodiversity while enhancing value chains for marine products. As such, the initiative we are discussing today is not the European Union's first foray into gaining a better understanding of the Queen Kong fishery in the Caribbean region. In 2000, uh, 2013, we funded the support to improve and harmonize the scientific approaches required to inform sustainable management of Queen Kong by Cariforum States initiative, which focused on the fishery in the Bahamas, Belize, Dominican Republic, Grenada and Haiti. Similarly, in 2001, we funded the Queen Kong fisheries and their management in Caribbean projects. Both studies spoke to the economic potential of the Queen Kong fishery to the region, but also stress the need for improving data collection and monitoring, strengthening of the legislative framework and increasing facilitation of regulation of trade of species. We therefore view this current initiative as a logical next step in achieving the economic potential of the Queen Kong fishery within the broader context of sound, responsible and sustainable environment management uh, management practices this work this workshop is therefore only a small part of the exercise going forward it is important that you are able to translate the actions validated over these next two days into tangible reality for the advancements of the sector this may be uh, evidenced in the ability of the OECS subregion to better benefit from arrangements under our economic partnership agreement, the IPA, with the region. It may be evidenced by increased market share for the OECS as part of the global Queen Kong markets. Ultimately, it should be evidenced by the improvement of the livelihood of the citizens of the OECS who benefit from this valuable fishery. I therefore look forward to the, not only an active discussion over the next two days, but more important, what happens once this workshop ends. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Truly an important milestone and we are pleased to partner with the European Union on a matter of such mutual importance. At this juncture, I would like to welcome Mr. David Vivas, who is the legal officer for UNCTAD, who has been an integral part of this project. Welcome. Thank you, Alicia. Good morning, Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, it is a pleasure to welcome all of you to this regional validation workshop with the OECS on a Blue Biotrade Action Plan for the Queen Kong. Uh, I would like to, to 
take the words of Minister Saboto, if CITES is the police, ONTAC will be the export and development agency. And the idea is very simple, work shoulder by shoulder, conch to conch, to ensure that we can have legal, sustainable, and traceable trade of seafood products from the region. So it is a common challenge. In this regard, healthy and marine biodiversity ecosystems are the natural capital and the base for any sustainable ocean economy, especially for big ocean states like OECS members. The conservation and sustainable use of this biodiversity and trade in oceans-based goods and services can provide important opportunities for the region in terms of economic development and improvement of livelihoods. In 2018, ONTAC estimated the value of tradable oceans-based goods and services in 2.5 trillion globally. That's equal to 3% of global GDP. So the oceans in trade has a significant significant share. ONTAC, as part of the UN Secretariat, has been helping developing countries since its creation to access the benefits of a globalized economy to make it more fair, more equitable. We provide analysis, technical assistance, and support consensus buildings, and we are the UN organization with more members, 195 a strong members, has the widest membership in the UN. And the idea is to use trade, investment, technology, and finance as tools for inclusive and sustainable development. ONTAC's BioTrade initiative was launched in 1996. This is not a new framework. It has been tested on terrestrial ecosystem for a long time successfully. We have more than 15 billion exports of BioTrade products globally in more than 80 countries. We are coming here to the OECS under this pilot project because it's the first time we tested in the marine environment, in the marine ecosystem. Uh, but what it is biotrade, really? It is basically an approach to product and services sourcing from marine biodiversity, which is commercialized in a way that respects people, nature, and legal frameworks. So we have a a, a, a structure for what it is biotrade. It's not an empty word. It's not just sustainability. We have seven principles and criteria developed over the years that you will see in the plan of action to be presented today that give content, that give uh, the possibility of monitoring and implementing actions related to these sustainability principles. The phase one of this project focuses on the iconic uh, uh, Kong Queen Kong, or Lambi, as known here. And again, as mentioned by before, with strong links to culture, economy, gastronomy, uh, uh, handicraft, etc. We have a, a more recent estimates that, uh, on the global market for, for Queen Kong. In 2018, one year uh, after it was mentioned recently, it was 74 million US dollars, so it's still growing. We hope, even if it's still growing, we can be able to manage this vulnerable species because sadly, it is also subject to unsustainable harvesting in many parts of the world, including in our, our beautiful Caribbean basin. And that's why uh, Lambi or Queen Kong has been listed in Appendix 2 of the CITES agreement, because this is vulnerable. It doesn't mean that trade is banned or forbidden. It means that trade is regulated. Now, the idea of this regulation is to ensure the survival, that we don't threaten the species, that we don't threaten the livelihood links to it. Uh, now, in, this today's, in today's workshop, uh, we have several objectives. One is obviously to implement SDG 14, the goal on life below water, but also to support the objective of the OECS development strategy 2019-2028 and to enable a post-COVID-19 recovery that we have suffered a lot, especially fisheries and many other activities such as tourism. We have three goals over these two days, present the findings of multi-stakeholder uh, value chain analysis, country analysis in three countries, and present a plan of action based on the seven principles of biotrade that will help us to arrive to safe harbor. We also will unveil prospects for a next phase where we can set and make sustainability real by implementing many of these specific actions, not only in the Queen Kong value chain, but looking at other promising products, including CMOS and an invasive species such as Sargasso. Now, we are very grateful for the support of the European Union for funding this project. We are also grateful for the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund to engage in the second phase, and we will have a presentation about this. 
uh, again, to, 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 to explore and expand the BioTrade approach to many other products and enable diversification and economic resilience. We would also like to thank Dr. Jules for the trusted vested in the United Nations, both ONTAC and CITES, in supporting this project. And also we will be counting with the support of the national UN country coordinators. You have one in each country, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in St. Lucia and in Grenada. They are active, they can support in the implementation, and they can help you in finding sources of funding, experts, scientific advice, etc. Finally, I'm confident that under this fruitful cooperation, we will arrive to safe harbor. Uh, I would like to say that my final message is that much is at stake uh, for the Queen Kong, for the livelihoods, but much is to be gained if we make sustainability not just a war, but a comparative advantage of the region, that whatever we produce is seen as sustainable per se. So again for one of the OECA members is again for all. We hope all can benefit and more can join. I would like to thank you again on behalf of ONTAG and the UN system all your support and your participation today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vivas. And we are inviting one of our partners who you've heard quite a bit about this morning. And I know she is smiling from air to air as she is about to address you. Welcome, Karen Gato, who's representing CITES. She is a scientific officer at CITES. Karen, thank you for being with us, Ms. Gato. Thank you and good morning all. I don't know whether to call myself a scientific officer or a police officer now, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, I would, first of all, I would like to um, just start off by saying a few thank yous. Um, obviously, I would like to thank uh, Minister Cesar and also the government representatives who spoke from Grenada and also St. Lucia because I think this has demonstrated to all of us just how important this project is being taken by the three participating countries. To have such high level engagement, um, I think is really important and it bodes well for the future of this project. Um, I also want to thank uh, the previous speakers uh, from the EU delegation, from OECS, UNCTAD, uh, some of my colleagues in CITES who've also been involved, and uh, two people who have not been mentioned yet, but I don't think we would be here if it wasn't for them, and that is our two consultants, uh, Alexander Gervin and uh, Maro Gangora, who I'm sure you are all familiar with. And um, we've heard many, of course I want to thank uh, Miss Alicia as well, because I, I'm really hoping that her enthusiasm will become infectious. Um, and so over the next two days that everybody will have as much enthusiasm uh, as Alicia has shown us here this morning and that we will uh, be still smiling uh, at the end of uh, tomorrow. Um, so uh, thank you, Alicia, for setting us all up so nicely. Um, that's very much appreciated. So I also wanted to thank Suskran, uh, who have done a lot of the organization in the background and also to our hosts here at this hotel and also at the Beachcombers where most of us are staying. Um, we've heard a lot about the collaborative approach on this project and, um, and how important this is. And I think it, just the fact that we're all here today, that we've come to this beautiful country and it's an absolute pleasure to actually be here. Um, it just shows how important collaboration is and for us to be able to meet in person, face to face, um, because it's one, it's one thing to read a study, um, you know, on a, in a, at your desk in Switzerland. It's a very different thing to come to the country and see what, what it is like on the ground, to speak to people in person. But it just shows you how seriously we take this um, and how happy we are to be involved in this project. Um, and, and I would say that many of us have worked on this project for more than two years and we only met each other this morning over breakfast. So, uh, you know, this is, it's, it's great that we have been able to collaborate in such a way, even though we have been working remotely. But a great pleasure to be here. Um, for, uh, as D David has alluded to earlier, CITES, um, our objective is to ensure that trade is legal, sustainable and traceable. Our objective is not to ban trade. I know that there is a perception out there that CITES is about banning trade. This couldn't be further from the truth. If CITES ends up in a situation where there is a recommendation to suspend trade, that this is a last resort. And this is an indication that CITES has failed. We have failed to help the parties to understand their obligations. We failed to help them 
um, to, uh, to know what to do to submit to stop getting into trouble by not submitting their reports or um, by uh, not developing strong non-detriment findings. So that's why we're here to help, um, not, not to punish. Um, and I really want to, to stress that. I know that um, Minister Cesar says that we are like the, um, it's like having a visit from the police, but maybe if you can consider it more like having, uh, going to the doctors uh, to, see, to have a health check, to see maybe you can get a prescription um, that will lead to uh, an improvement in health um, and also secure, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, we'll, we'll secure a long and happy life, not just, you know, long into the future, not just for the Queen Conch, but also for everyone who relies on the Conch for their livelihoods. So please, please think of us more as here to help than to, um, to punish. Um, I think the last thing I wanted to say is that the country case studies have, um, have really put together all the, the situation in the three countries and it has detailed the challenges but also the possible opportunities. But we need now a plan of action. We've seen that the political will is there for this. We've seen we have this you know, strong collaborative approach. So I'm really hopeful to see how we can come out of this meeting with a clear plan of action as to how to move this forward. Um, and I think that that will ensure not only the sustainability and long-term survival of the conch, but as I said, the communities that, that rely on it. And um, I very much look forward to working with you all over the next two days. And thank you all for the invitation to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. Thank you very much. And I really do hope we can carry the enthusiasm over the next two days. And when we report to the people of the region what we have achieved here, they too will feel our enthusiasm. As Ms. Gaynor said, it is one thing to read a study. It is another thing to hear us talk about this theoretically. But nothing beats seeing for yourself what the Queen Kong industry in the Eastern Caribbean is all about. This is an exciting time for the region and we want to share our enthusiasm with you. So we invite you now to view this video that has been taken from Grenada, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The iconic sound of the Queen Conch signals many things across the Caribbean. For some, particularly in the OECS territories of Grenada, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, it is the call of opportunity. I love diving. I was walking before I come back and like before I start back diving and I leave my walk to go back in the sea. You look up the hill, all those houses are conch, lobsters, the sea in general, but conch and lobsters are the two main money orders. You could pay your bills, feed your family. Yeah man, it's, it's much lucrative than, especially on a good day, than having to get up and go to work for somebody for a few pennies. It sustains families. Um, I am a product of that. <laughs> My dad, that is what he does up to this day. And um, send all of us to school and even grandchildren now is going to school from that industry as well. In October 2020, the OECS, in collaboration with the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development and CITES, launched the Blue Biotrade Project. It was financed by the European Union through the Right Program. The Blue Biotrade project aims to empower fishers and small-scale coastal operators from Grenada, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines to produce and trade Queen Kong responsibly. One way of achieving the full potential of the Queen Kong industry is to study the resource itself and have an appreciation for the value chain. Studies done in Grenada, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines note encouraging opportunities. The first phase of the study was very encouraging. Um, 
because we are we are seeing a number of um, a number of challenges that can be addressed through concerted effort and through collaboration with international agencies, but amongst um, project uh, countries. Um, so we're seeing opportunities to address those challenges, but we're also seeing opportunities to improve sustainability. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, popularly known as CITES, provides guidance on the sustainable management of this invaluable resource. In terms of conch, once you're exporting the meat, it would require a CITES permit from St. Lucia. If you are importing it, you would require a CITES permit from the country of origin. The three pillars of CITES um, is to ensure that uh, trade, international trade in CITES listed species is legal, sustainable and traceable. So this will be of benefit not only to the species, but also to the livelihoods of the fishers um, who fish the species. And it will ensure that the species survives long into the future so that this industry will continue for future generations. The information gathered through phase one of the Blue Biotrade project is being studied and incorporated into an action plan for the advancement of the Queen Conch industry. Key to future success is an ongoing stock assessment to determine what corrective measures need to be implemented. Um, so it's very, very important that um, we do further science, further stock assessments to figure out, well, what is what is called the maximum sustainable yield that will allow the population to consistently replenish itself. We also really have to consider um, a closed season that's coordinated where there's no harvest of being conked. Um, to allow them to, to, to mate and reproduce and spread. We also have to consider marine protected areas and no-take zones where taking count is, is not allowed. There can be no meaningful development of the Queen Conch industry if the views and experiences of every stakeholder, especially the fishers and divers, are not taken into consideration. The approach is a simple one, which implies that it's, a, it's an idea to enable commercialization and investment on biodiversity-based products under an environmental, social, and economic sustainable criteria. Consumers want this. They want to be sure that they are not contributing to illegal trade, that they are contributing to livelihoods of people on the ground, and it will also mean that um, the fishers should be able to get a higher price for their commodity um, if they can show that this is a, a well-regulated and monitored um, uh, commercial venture. So we can harvest products from nature, add value, and at the same time ensure that they are there for future generations. <laughs> It must be stressed that the Queen Conch is not threatened by extinction at this moment. Presently, the Queen Conch is also under threat due to issues such as overfishing and climate change. We know that we have been seeing some degradation in the habitats. Uh, we also have uh, acidification. And it's not easy getting the conks because right now that they you you have to go real deep to get them. Most times about 80 to 100 feet, but there are there are places where that you have to go to about 150, 120 feet sometimes. There was a lot of 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 conks, you know, in terms of the close range area, but now it's a little bit, you know, it less and you now have to go a little further out for it. If your catch is going down and you're exerting more effort to look for it, that tells us that there's something wrong with the, with the population. It gives us a, it's like an indicator to say that there's something not quite right. Okay, we have a situation where I believe the silt from development on land affects um, um, the, the, the grass, the, the seagrass, which they live on. Particularly with the high level of pollution from land, like sedimentation, Kong does not like sediment on the seafloor. 
Many divers are making their own conservation efforts and considering other ways of ensuring the sustainability of their species. Yeah, we check on the size. Yeah. Um, with, with, with lobster, we, we try to, yeah, there's a season for the lobster, but there is not a season for the lambie, for the kong. So we, we look at the size, you know, and we try to not overfish at one area. They understand the importance of not taking the juvenile conks as a conch without the fled lip. And they would, when they go into certain areas and they realize it's an area hap, um, populated primarily by juvenile conch, they would actually leave the area alone and fish another area or give an area a rest so that it can be replenished and fish another area. So that's really a um, positive um, step that they are taking and we try to work with them on that. They give it a closing season like the lobsters, but we need to put something in place that the seamen, while the season closed, they could get like something like a token or something that will help them sustain the family at the point in time. We're seeing the fishers two months of the year, you can't earn any income. We're actually, we're actually not creating a, a socially sustainable situation, right? Um, so ideally we need to do what is called uh, ecosystem approaches to fisheries, where we really incorporate the local community in deciding some of these measures, but also in enforcement of these measures. That's really one way in which you can guarantee, uh, not just, you know, environmental sustainability, but reflect really um, social needs. While the Queen Kong has contributed significantly to livelihoods in these territories, many believe there is still vast opportunity to further develop the industry, making it more profitable for stakeholders at all levels. I think they should be doing a little more, the price should be a little higher, because everything is going up. So if the price go a little more, we should be able to live a little better. I, I see a much more vibrant industry I'm um, coming out of, of the conch um, here in Grenada. The Queen Conch is widely regarded as a delicacy and many believe there is potential to explore new ways of enjoying the seafood regionally and internationally. We used to do tenderize count. I bought in a tenderize machine from the US. We will tenderize the whole count for you and we will season it and vacuum seal it and put it on the local market. A lot of people give us thumbs up with you know, such a process, but there is a course added to it. Conk could be done in so many different ways. You can, you can do a curry conk, you can do a vegetable conk, you can do conk cakes, you can do conk chowders, you can do butterfly conk, you know, you can do it in the seafood pasta. I think we can add value um, to the conk. For instance, the trimmings that we're actually disposing of. In the near future, I'm going to be processing the trimmings and to make conk chowder and so forth, package it in nice packaging, probably to one pound, two pound, and export to the States. We ship, as I mentioned, to Dubai, and they all want it in large quantities. You know, sometimes we, we might ship 5,000 pounds, you know, 2,000, but they want container loads of this. Every part of the conks can be used. The shell can be used for ornaments, decorate, um, to make beads, you know? It's basically like pearl ivory-like. You can use um, the hands to make earrings. You can use different parts of the meal, well, you could cook the whole conks. I had Paul far as India was interested of the shell that they make buttons and necklaces and you know, all different type of stuff. Currently, there's nothing in place for the utilization of the shells to add value to the, to the shells. In 2020, conch made up 62.7% of St. Vincent's exported fish and fish products. Our main markets is um, in the US, where we do 85, 95, 100% clean conch. So um, we move anywhere from five to 10,000 pounds by, by monthly. In Miami presently, a pound of conks is 30 US dollars. The realization is conch is one of those high value, low volume species, right? So right there, the sustainability part of it, people would always go and harvest for money because it fetches a high price. But the volume, 
right? The um, age of sexual maturity, the reproduction rates and so forth needs to be taken into consideration. I think it is very important for the fishers to uh, understand that CITES is not here to, to stop them from trading, from fishing and trading, but we are here to ensure that um, the species is not threatened by that. The fishermen can have a livelihood from that, that the consumer can be assured that the um, the, fit, the conch that they are eating has been sustainably and legally uh, sourced. And again, as I said, this will ensure the long term viability and survival of this species and hopefully the, the fisheries industry of Queen Conch in the Caribbean as well. Never. And that is the reality of the Queen Kong industry in the Eastern Caribbean. There is so much that I can say about this video, but you know what? I am going to hand over to the point person here, um, the Agriculture Desk of the OECS Commission, which is manned by Lench Favre, who is the Senior Technical Specialist for Agriculture, and also Mrs. Natasha de tilville Moise have been working so very hard on this Blue Bio Trade project, and I do not want to leave them out. So let us welcome Mr. Favre at this point. Thank you very much. Um, let me just take the opportunity to adopt the uh, salutation protocol that previously established. Um, as a little background for the, the, um, this project, this video, I would like to thank um, my colleague, um, Natasha Little, who insisted that, that we, we do this video. And um, if I have to recall what um, um, Dr. Jules said, the most important um, people, person, group in this conversation is are the, the fishers. And this video clearly demonstrated it. It showed um, what their activities are, what their preferences are, um, the, their daily plight, and also indicated um, in what, the, what the expectations are, what their hopes are for the future. And it also showed that they are committed to the industry. Um, one other thing that came out of this, um, this work that we did with um, UNTAD, CITES, um, um, and the OECS, and the member states, um, was a collaboration. Um, we've developed a very good working relationship with, um, with the member states, um, also um, CITES and, and UNTAD. And I can only... Um, my expectation is, is moving forward, um, coming out of this workshop, and based on the, our uh, plan moving forward, um, there can only be um, increased collaboration and, and hope for better things. And um, thank you very much for, um, I like to thank the European Union for giving us the opportunity to, to, do, to work on this. And I like to say personally, I learned a lot um, in this video. And, and, Thank you very much for your time. Now everyone knows I'm a bit vertically challenged because I have to bring down the mic. <laughs> I hope you all are as excited as we are to move the Eastern Caribbean into the future. This brings us to the end of our program for today on behalf of OECS, UNCTAD, CITES, the EU, the API, and all of our partners. I am Alicia Ali from the OECS Commission reminding you that we are one community growing together. So until next time, au revoir, adios, merci en pile, goodbye. <laughs>